Why is like every IT nerd on the interwebs talking about home labs? Like home labs are like the thing. You go into the YouTube machine and you look up stuff on home labs, they're everywhere. And that's maybe what led you to my video. Let's talk a little bit about what is a home lab? What is the purpose of a home lab? And then we'll also give you some ideas about what you could then build. My name is Emilio. I love, love, love tech. I've loved tech, tech for a long time and I've built myself lots of home labs and they're awesome. Would love it if you also subscribe. If you love tech, click on the notification bell as well. That way you are notified when we are releasing new stuff. So what is a lab? Well, think about a lab such as a scientific lab. This is a place where they're going and testing things. There's an environment where they can go and build things, try things, demo things, make sure that things are working correctly, make sure that things are not breaking. That is exactly what you're gonna be doing in this lab environment. So this lab environment is a testing ground for you to get better in whatever you want to be learning or getting better at in technology. What I found is when I was starting off in technology, I mean, I've been in technology for now over 20 years. And when I started off, I knew this much about technology. And when I started working in a company, I found that great, I'm gonna get exposed to a lot of this awesome tech in a company, but at the same time, I'm not able to play with certain things. So for example, I started off as a help desk person, somebody starting off in help desk and just doing some basic troubleshooting, fixing computers, helping staff out in a company, but I wasn't allowed to touch the servers. I wasn't allowed to touch the switches and all the networking equipment. I wasn't able to go into a data center and play around with all of the fancy tech in there because I was not advanced enough. So if I'm not able to go and actually play with the servers and play with the networking, how am I supposed to learn about all of that technology if the company won't give me that opportunity? The home lab is where you fix that problem. You can actually learn a lot of the tech that is needed for then you to be able to go to a company or go to your boss or go to your manager and say, hey, look, um, I would like to get exposure and start playing around with this server technology. And here is what I've been doing at home in my lab environment and see, I can build all of this sort of stuff. I understand the terminology. And then your boss, somebody in a company may be giving you more responsibility because they now can see that you have that experience. Even if it is in a home lab, you've now got that experience to be able to do that in a real network. And it's very common that you're gonna be in a company that is not gonna let you play with certain things, especially production equipment, because that could have a massive, massive impact to that company. So for example, imagine you've got yourself your domain controller. Now the, the domain controller is this big piece of equipment that is managing a domain. Well, you don't wanna go and start playing around with that and start learning about that domain controller in a production environment. You don't wanna be going and playing around with a core switch and you accidentally change the port configuration or mess something up, the impact could be really, really bad. So the lab environment is a place where you can test your learning, test all this equipment. So a home lab really is just a network. It's just a network made up of different networking components, but it's generally gonna be a little bit smaller than a real life network. Okay, if you're thinking about a company, a company is gonna have a lot of equipment. They may have a data center, they may have some server rooms, some comms room, racked with a whole bunch of equipment. Firewalls, the switches and routers, the server equipment, their storage equipment, and that stuff is gonna cost thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to set up and get working for that company. And look, you may be able to set up something like that at home if you're a bajillionaire, but for the average person, you won't be able to go and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to have all that equipment at home. Well, in a home lab, you can actually mimic the things that are in a real life network. You will still be able to build some servers, for example, but they're not gonna need to be a full rack server that you've spent $20,000 on. You could have something like this. I've just got myself a Mac mini, a Mac mini, that I can set up with some virtualization server software and actually go and build some virtual machines right onto it. I could have an old laptop. Inside of it is a hard drive, some RAM, some CPU, all that you need to go and start building some server software directly onto it. I could go and load Linux onto this. I could go run Windows Server onto this. I could make this into a domain controller and that becomes part of my home lab. How do you hook it up all together? Well, here is a standard switch an eight port switch, I'm running all my devices into that and then I can connect it all together. Now for me, I'm now somebody who is able to interview people. So I interview a lot of techs, engineers, software people for different sorts of roles across different sorts of companies. I love it when I have a candidate, when I have somebody who's coming in for an interview 
who has their own home lab because it shows me that that person is willing to learn. So you need to have your own home lab. Now you don't have to go and spend a whole bunch of money to get started. You may not even have to spend any money if you've already got equipment laying around. So if you've got old computers, if your friends and family have got old computers, old switches, old home routers, get them. You can use all of that to build a home lab. If you've got your own equipment, that's great. If you need to go and buy some secondhand stuff, maybe go off to eBay and look for some old equipment, that is great. But if you've got an old PC, an old desktop PC, that is, you know, it's running a little bit slow, why don't you go and buy some more RAM for it? Maybe upgrade the CPU, get it running a little bit better. And that is the beauty of a home lab, is you can customize it with the stuff that you've already got. But remember, if you wanna learn a specific technology, if you wanna go down the networking route, then build your home lab with the networking components in mind. If you wanna learn more about VMware, then go and build your lab to have hardware that can be capable of running VMware's ESXi, go and build virtual servers, all of that. If you just wanna learn a little bit about everything, then that's great, you can build your lab towards that. Now in my case, behind me right here, I've got some equipment. Now this is some equipment that I've had for a very, very long time, and some equipment that I purchased specifically for this lab. Now, none of the stuff here is very, very expensive, but you can also go and get yourself good quality stuff if you wanna build yourself a bigger and better lab. But just to get started, all you really need is just some spare computers, potentially a spare router and a spare switch, and that will at least give you the basics to then get started. Because once you have those basic components, those basic, that basic hardware, you can then go and start installing the relevant software, the server software, but essentially the software to convert these computers, these PCs, these old laptops into servers, and then you can actually start building and learning a lot of the technologies in that server space. So what's some of the equipment that I have? Maybe giving you some ideas about what sort of stuff you can be getting. Now firstly, I've got some old desktop computers. This is an old Dell, this is an old HP desktop. There's nothing special about them. They used to be computers that I would use years and years ago, and then they just were sitting inside of a cupboard, and I thought, hey, why don't I look at repurposing those computers and using them in the lab? And that is one of the great things about a lab, is that you can actually go and repurpose hardware that you no longer need. My general rule, and something that you may wanna consider, is don't throw old equipment away, right? If you're looking at buying yourself a better computer, you're looking at upgrading your PC, you're looking at upgrading your Mac, you're looking at maybe getting yourself a new Wi-Fi router, a new switch, whatever it may be, don't throw out your old equipment because you never know down the track, you may actually be able to repurpose that and use it for another reason for another purpose. Of course, these desktops have just got all the standard components inside of them. You've got a motherboard, you've got some RAM, you've got your CPU, you've got your graphics card, and other sorts of peripherals in there, which essentially are the essential building blocks to start building your lab. Next to that is an old Lenovo ThinkPad laptop. This is the smaller laptop. Again, it's the laptop that I used to have, and I used to use quite a fair bit. And again, it was just sitting in a cupboard, and I thought, you know what, why don't I repurpose that and actually install server software onto it? and that's essentially what I've done. In terms of other standard sorts of desktop home computers that I have got laying around, I had an old Mac, this is an old Mac mini uh, desktop. This was used as a media center. And yes, you can actually use a Mac. Even if you've got a Mac, you can repurpose it, install server software. We're gonna be looking at this technology called VMware and installing ESXi onto it, essentially converting that computer, that Mac and the other ones into what's called a hypervisor so that you then you can go and install and build Windows servers. You can build Linux servers all of that. And then right at the top, I've then got myself a small Intel NUC. This is a very small form factor computer, not very powerful, but it is great to get you started with the lab. The Intel NUC itself, I specifically went and purchased that. Everything else is old equipment. And the reason that I purchased the NUC is initially that's how I started with my lab. Initially, I thought, you know what, I wanna have a lab environment set at home because I was working in a company there was an awesome setup, you know, there was a big data center and a lot of equipment on there, but I couldn't get my hands on that equipment just yet. I wasn't capable, I wasn't technical enough to actually go and learn how to, you know, use the servers, how to use the networking equipment, how to rack things and do all of that sort of stuff. So then what I thought is, hey, 
I need to get started myself. So the very, very first thing that I actually went and did was go and purchase myself that little Intel NUC. I just wanted a small, simple computer that I could stick a whole bunch of RAM into it. And then I installed Windows Server initially, but then later on I went and installed VMware's ESXi and then went and installed some virtual servers inside of that. So that's one that I did go and buy. So now you've got to go and consider what sort of equipment that you've got. Do you have computers to at least get started in building your lab? If you do, great. If you don't, hey, why did you ask friends and family? Maybe they've got some spare equipment that they no longer are using and they can maybe just give it to you or maybe they can sell it to you for a real cheap bargain and that way you can get started. Now, the other thing is using marketplaces. You got your Facebook, you got eBay, other sorts of marketplaces where you can go and pick up some old computers quite, quite cheap. And that's another really good place to go because some people will throw them out for $5, $10, and you can get yourself a few computers that then you can repurpose with the server software. Now, before we look at those switches and there's a storage unit there as well, down the very, very bottom are a couple of actual servers. These are rack-based servers and they're called rack-based servers because they slot inside of a rack. So in a corporate environment, you've got generally like a data center, you've got server rooms, you've got comms rooms, and then there are essentially big cabinets or racks where all of the server networking storage equipment essentially lives. Now those two, I just wanted some old rack servers to stick inside my lab because I wanted to learn about rack servers. Because it's one thing having yourself some old desktops, and that's great. You can have your, your old desktops, your old laptops, install server software, Windows Server, and learn all of the server software side of things. But then you've got the physical server side of things. So in this case, when you're gonna go into a corporate environment, when you're playing with the technology in a real business, they're gonna generally have rack-based servers or rack-based or blade servers. There's tower servers as well, but commonly you're gonna have either a rack or a blade. Blades are generally a little bit smaller, but they still slot inside of a rack in some form or fashion. And they've got a lot more uh, server grade, enterprise grade sort of components and hardware inside of them. So there is a little bit of a difference between a uh, server based rack and a server-based desktop, because both of them you can install Windows Server or VM or ESXi or other sorts of server software. But of course, the rack, the rack server itself has been custom built, custom designed to be able to perform the best when you are running server software onto it. So you're gonna be able to build a lot more virtual machines because you can install a lot more RAM, you can install maybe dual CPUs or more, and you're just gonna have a lot better processing power out of a rack-based server. But of course, on the flip side, a rack-based server is big, it's heavy, and they are loud. So if you're gonna be looking at building your own home lab, whether that's at home, whether that's in a workspace, just be aware of that noise. Because a rack server, or any sort of rack equipment, that could be also from the switches, that could be also storage devices, are gonna be very, very loud, because they've got very, very big fans inside of them, that are designed to keep the actual equipment cool and running at its optimal you know, performance. So just be aware of that. So you don't have to go down the rack-based server route, uh, but if you do, you're just gonna get better performance, but just be aware that you're gonna need a space, a place to put all of this sort of stuff, and it's gonna cost you more money from an electricity perspective. You also need to keep it more cool, and that's where there's fans inside, but also in the place where you're gonna be building that home lab, you're gonna need some good ventilation and good air conditioning to, to sort of keep everything cool. Then I've got myself three switches. I've got a old Cisco switch, I've got an old Netgear switch, and then I've got a fairly newer Cisco Meraki switch, which is obviously gonna be my primary switch because it's more newer, it's got better technology, it's cloud-based, all of that sort of stuff, and that's why I've got three. And the reason I've got three is just so that I can split my load. Uh, when you are building your lab, if you are wanting to focus on networking and you wanna understand network topologies, understand things about VLANing and subnets and things like that, it's sometimes good to have some real life equipment, real life switches, so that you can actually configure the ports, the specific ports on those switches to do specific things. 
You can you know, allocate the speed of that port. You can allocate what VLAN it's a part of. You can actually split your switch into different subnets, into different VLANs, and then you can connect those switches together. And the main reason you may want to do that is, for example, if you're thinking of in a real life company, you've got computers out on your floor. You know, the staff members in a particular department, maybe the marketing department, are gonna be, maybe there's 30 people in marketing. All of those computers, you may wanna put them on one specific VLAN or one specific subnet. But the marketing team work on stuff that's maybe confidential, and the other team, maybe a finance team, who also have confidential information, maybe all those computers in the finance team are on a different subnet on a different VLAN. So all of these physical computers need to be plugged into some form of physical switch. They're gonna be running via what's called a patch panel. And then from the patch panel, it will then be connected into a switch. And from an administrative perspective and from a security perspective, there may be requirements to have those two departments on separate VLANs so that you can't accidentally jump onto the other subnet, onto the other VLAN, unless you have right authentication or you have the right route in place. And that's also true with servers and with other sorts of server-based or infrastructure-based technologies. You don't want your servers to be on the same VLAN, the same subnet as computers that are out on the floor in a business. And that's why sometimes getting yourself a corporate sort of switch, such as my Cisco here, I can actually specifically say, these ports are gonna be this VLAN, these ports are this VLAN. So then when I'm building my lab, I can plug in my servers into these first lots of ports on this VLAN, and then my desktops may be running Windows 11 into this other set. And yes, they are on the same physical switch, but logically, the way the software is being configured, they're gonna be on different VLANs, so there's extra security right there. Now, the other great thing about having the real life switch, or well, the enterprise grade switch, is the Cisco devices have got technology or the software, it's called iOS, and if you're gonna get yourself into network administration, engineering, maybe into security, it's good to understand iOS and how to configure, this is not iOS like iPhone iOS or iPad iOS, this is iOS from Cisco, it's good to know about iOS, know the commands, know how to configure things on these sorts of switches. And that's why I've decided to go that route. Then of course, you've got your Meraki sorts of switches. A lot of companies are going down Meraki. And even though uh, Meraki is sort of owned by Cisco, Meraki's are more cloud-based. So knowing iOS is good on that, on you know, from the uh, other switches, on the Cisco switches, but understanding the Meraki side of things is also really good because that will help you because a lot of companies are using that a lot more than they used to. And then these other two devices here are called storage units. So you've got a SAN or a NAS. In my case, I've got two NASs by a company called Synology. This is a, essentially it's a, well, it's a NAS, a network attached storage. So it's a storage unit. It's just a device with a whole bunch of hard drives inside of it. And the whole purpose of that is just to serve my network with storage capacity, a place for my VMs to live, my virtual service to live, a place where I could perhaps build some sort of a file server, and that's where all of the data lives, and then that's accessible on the network. So you don't have to go and buy a whole bunch of USB hard drives and then plug those into people's computers. You could buy something like a NAS, and then all of the data lives on that, and then that services out the uh, computers on your network and even services your servers. So your virtual machines, if you're building VMware ESXi, right? And then you're building VMs inside of that. Well, those VMs could sit on a NAS, but you've got a SAN and a NAS. They're slightly different. Yes, they are both storage devices, but they serve different purposes. One is block-based, one is file-based, and there's other sorts of technicalities behind that also. If you wanna know a lot more about HomeLabs, I've got a full length training course available on my Udemy channel. Look me up, Emilio Aguero on Udemy. Otherwise, there's a link down below. Learn a whole bunch more about HomeLabs, but a whole bunch of other tech as well to become just better at technology as a whole. Hey, subscribe, click on the button on the bell so you don't miss out on anything. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next video.